everybody. Welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It's me and Nate back at it um, mid-September. It's, uh, you know, I gotta, we don't number our, our podcast episodes, so sometimes I have to just kind of give you an idea of, for those of you who are listening to Backlogs, where we're at politically. And uh, September 20th is where we're at politically today. Um, although most of the politics is happening on your side of the pond uh, these days, Nate. So well, how, I don't know how, about are, that. how are you doing? I'm all right, man. I'm I'm pretty tired. Uh, you know, I've been running a lot, so that's been great. Been uh, letting my wife coach me on distance running, trying to do um, heart rate training where you monitor your heart rate the whole time and you have to keep your heart rate under 150. Um, so it's been interesting because I have a friend of See, mine who I was... was- you went and started explaining it before I can make a joke of how much does it really take to tell you to keep running. But no, well, we got to talk about heart rates. No, well, go ahead. you got to realize that I was a competitive runner in high school and I was also in the army, you know that. And I don't think I ever really did this kind of coaching because most of the coaching we got was like, run faster, you bitch. And that was it. Yeah. Um, so my fastest 5K ever was uh, 1839 when I was 18 years old and about 40 pounds lighter than I am now. So uh, that's probably not going to happen again. But I want to do an Olympic distance triathlon. And part of doing oh, wow. an Olympic distance triathlon is once you've done the swim that's like 1,500 yards or meters and a 40K bike ride, you have to run a 10K. And, you know, I can run a 10K now. It's no problem. I'm not even worried about the swim or the biking because, I mean, I swim. I used to swim competitively and, and I, I bike a lot to get around. But, you know, people who do well in these things are running like fucking 40 minute. 40, uh, 40 minute 10Ks after having swam and cycled. So my 10K time is not great and I need to work on that. And, you know, part of getting better at running, according to my wife is, hey, just do this stuff. It really, it actually will improve your, um, you know, your overall running time. Stuff will get easier. You'll be able to run faster for longer, keeping your heart rate down. And then it'll, and then, you know, you just do this in cycles and then you do speed work for a while and you go back to it and that and so on and so forth. So, you know, you know, we're going to get requests for, um, your wife's training regimen. So, uh, you know, to, so, so that people can, uh, run faster and longer. Um, I personally am just happy if I can do my normal three mile run without stopping and mm -hmm. like, needing to walk. That's I'm, I was never competitive running in the military. I've never competitively ran anywhere. Um, but I do just to just be like, okay, I'm, I'm almost 40, but I'm still in decent shape because I can jog three miles without throwing up. So that's, that's my, my health litmus test these days. My fastest two mile in the army was 1206, but I was much faster in high school, which makes sense because I wasn't rucking and I was lighter and running was like my sole sport aside from swimming. Um, I would say this has been interesting because, you know, for however long it's always been like run, don't stop running. Whereas when you're doing heart rate training, you kind of have to stop sometimes if you're about to go over. Like you, you, you are not supposed to go over 150. Mm -hmm. So like I ran a 7K yesterday. So that's about 4.6 miles. And under normal circumstances, I would be able to run that much faster than this. But I ran it in like 43 minutes because I had to keep my heart rate down. However, it's weird because you do this and you just uh, like, I don't feel ravenously hungry after. I don't feel insanely tired after. But I had a big break uh, over the weekend because, you know, I went running. I want to say I went running on Friday and then I had, uh, or I certainly went running on Thursday. And then I, on Saturday, I had to um, go down to the queue with Milo to record Britonology on location. Um, so I was there for that for a couple hours and I walked like 16,000 steps that day and I was just fucking smoked. So um, aside from walking to the grocery store to buy stuff to cook dinner on Sunday, I didn't, didn't work out. And then yeah, I ran 7K yesterday. I'm, I think I'm going to total about uh, like 24, 25 kilometers on my bike today because I had to run to do a, a meeting at a venue and then come to the studio and then come home tonight. So I've been like exercising a ton. I'm okay. I mean, politics in this country is stupid. I'm just tired from exercising. I've been sleeping really well. I've been eating well. I haven't been drinking any alcohol. I haven't been smoking weed. Like I've been trying to really focus on, on health overall. Um, but uh, politics in this country is just like... I don't want to be a spoiled baby, but like for the last couple of days, I, I, I really want to get my personal writing done, you know, my writing goals accomplished. And I've just been trying to make it a point to not be on Twitter. And it, it's yeah. so much nicer. It's just so much nicer. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, if we can, you know, may, maybe we can start really injecting, uh, you know, dad, um, dad advice into some of these things. You know, it's if you're mad online, man, that's not the way to be. That's just going to make that's not going to get you anything. And like the thing that I that you kind of have to realize about there's some politics you can do something about and there's some politics that you can't. And, uh, you know, you're just going to overall be happier if you're, you know, doing like you're doing, you know, find find a personal goal and uh, and do it. Um, you know, I'm going to be I'm I'm going to be writing a really big piece for task and purpose pretty soon. And I'm going to throw a lot of time and energy into into that that I'm very excited about because. I don't know, like <laughs> reading Twitter is fucking boring and sad sometimes. And, but you know, I have my people that I love on there too, so I can never get rid of it completely, but goddamn, some people like, I swear to God, stop, stop fucking putting Michael Tracy in my timeline. I'm going to start, I'm going to start muting people for that shit. I blocked that guy and you guys still just cannot let him go. He's, he's a right wing fascist dipshit. Let him be. I, uh, Need the water. I'm going to I'm going to drop this in here and we may cut it out because our audience uh may not find this as funny as me and Milo do. <laughs> but to describe the degree to which Milo and I like what we find funny at this point like I don't really I mean I'll I'll, I'll make some points but it's not really accomplishing anything so I've been trying to limit my time on Twitter and I I've been playing GeoGuessr instead of browsing Twitter while I edit podcasts. And I think I've gone into detail to this before but um where I struggle is that it's hard to do anything that requires any kind of attention span while you're editing podcasts because the thing is, if you get too deep in concentration, you'll miss things. You'll miss mistakes, sounds, things that are messed up, etc. Whereas Twitter being sort of bite-sized, you're constantly sort of stopping and starting and stopping and starting. Mm -hmm. And that puts you in a better situation to like notice things because you're not kind of deep in thought on one thing. Mm -hmm. And GeoGuessr, I'm sure you've played it before. You know what it is? Yeah, the it gives you a random Google Street picture, View and Google you, picture, and you, and you, 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 have to, you have to try to figure where it is on the map. Yeah. So I've been doing that to some extent, just to like not be on Twitter. Um, but then today, Milo was like, he came into the studio and he's like, "Did you see that thing I DM'd you?" And I was like, "What?" And you know, it could be anything. It could be an opportunity for a production gig. It could be a show. It could be something. But no, it could it's be something disgusting. It's some Facebook thing that someone has photoshopped where it's like. It's a guy in a car driving and a guy on a bike says, man, I wish I had a new car. And then uh, the guy on, on waiting for the bus is looking at the guy on the bike and being like, man, I wish I had a bike. And then the next one was uh, a guy sitting in a balcony in a wheelchair looking down. And one presumes the sort of Facebook thing is supposed to be like, man, I wish I could walk. And it was like, you know, always count your blessings. But instead it's Photoshop saying, man, I wish I could fuck that guy's ass. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, wow, Milo, you've <laughs> We're starting I, I feel like I feel like we're starting to turn back to irony Twitter, which uh is good because our brains were broken in a much more fun way back then, at least. So maybe maybe these absurd jokes, maybe the cold pocket uh photoshops will start coming back and things <laughs> will just be fucking weird again. Like it should be. Yeah, like, it's very man, funny because like the guy the guy getting mad online and like, are you fucking talking shit about my dog on here? I'm so mad right now. They're just stripping his <laughs> yeah. clothes off and getting fully yeah. naked. Like, yeah. And, 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 and then it's just like, uh, I feel like two out of the three accounts involved in that have at some point told you that you're a baby killer. So it's just like, right. fuck. <laughs> Sigh. It got it got real like I mean we all we all got real politically because I mean what we're all in our late twenties early thirties we were starting to get politically motivated we liked the idea of Bernie Sanders and then like it it really went off the rails and and yeah I get I get accused of killing Arabs in Afghanistan which was a very confusing um, uh, accusation because there are no Arabs in Afghanistan but uh, well, I mean if you did I mean, unless it, they, it, if you, if you as the PAO were were, were, were killing Al Qaeda <laughs> guys who were you know Arab mujahideen in Afghanistan then like you must have been like <laughs> right. the most fucking secret squirrel ass PO to ever breathe air yeah, I, I must have been the PAO that had like a, a fucking secret word that uh, spons sparks me into going and murdering a bunch of mujahideen or something which i mean to be fair that would have at least been useful but now i just get accused of killing babies or something which i don't know I'd... Mm. <laughs> I never 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 uh never killed any babies never killed any people i was never in a position yeah. to fire my weapon uh, the one time that i thought i was gonna be uh i waited very very deliberately to make sure that i saw a weapon being pointed at us and when the smoke cleared it was very obvious that 
what we were seeing was just some kids fucking around and it was no threat at all. Mm -hmm. Um, so I recall that, that like, had I been one of these trigger happy assholes in that situation, you know, call it the literal fog of war because there was smoke in the aftermath of a bombing. Um, yeah, we just shot a bunch of kids and it's like, fucking what's, what, 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 what would that have served? No, no point at all. Like that kind of shit. And that's, yeah, that's kind of why you don't drop a bunch of random ass Americans in a fucking war zone, you know? So, uh, that's my, my big complaint is, uh, yeah, uh, let's let's create fewer veterans by not doing that. But um, you know that's that's been the ethos of this show for a long time. And um, what I what I I think that without without really wanting to fixate on imaginary criticism, I would say that it it it, it doesn't escape my notice sometimes that some of the kind of like vitriolic responses that you and I get as regards this show kind of fixate on what they think the show is about and what the show must be like. In the sense that they're like, oh, here are a bunch of these guys, you know, with a Patreon who are telling stories about doing war crimes and, you know, sexually assaulting women in Afghanistan or some fucked up insane shit. And it's like that, obviously nothing could be further from the truth, but that kind of tells me more about like where that person's imagination is going versus anything mm-hmm. else. Because quite frankly, if you're going to tell badass, you know, I, I, I straight up murk some kids war stories, like you would be on like the Dan Babongo podcast or whatever the fuck. Like, yeah, we'd be making way more money if we were talking about <laughs> how how fun it is to like. Yeah, 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 yeah. We we, we would be we would be in in getting endorsed by Eddie Gallagher's special spin out version of Black Rifle Coffee or whatever the hell. Yeah, yeah, like like the point of this show is don't join the military. It's bad, and if you're in the military, get out of the military. But also, like you know, here are the sort of facts of what life in the military are like, both for curious civilians and for people who uh, may have been in and want to contextualize their experience. I guess. And, you know, I'm not going to shit on anybody for, like, being in the military either because where else are you going to get, like, it's, where where else are you going to get 30 days paid vacation on day one? You know, where else are you going to get a paycheck? It fucking sucks. It's not much. But, like, when you're 18 and you're looking at the rest of the prospects of, uh, of this fucking world that we have created for ourselves, being like, well, maybe I can do four years, work, you know, flying a desk in logistics or something like that or be a quartermaster or be a supply sergeant and uh, not have to you know, not have to do some real war stuff and get some things under your belt. Like, ah, I mean, I can't look, I, I, again, don't join the army, but I'm also, if you're going to join the army, I'm not going to like shit on you and tell you you're a bad person. Everybody's got to make their own decisions. So, yeah. I mean, I would say that, I mean, here's the thing, right? We say, don't do it. We strongly recommend that you listen to our experiences and don't do it. But it's not like I can be like, you are a certified bad person for doing it because like I did it. We fucking did it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like what kind of asshole would I be? Like, please disregard the fact that I'm talking like Andrew Tate right now. And also I joined the army, but that doesn't count. I did it for woke reasons. Like, you know, I was as much of a fucking idiot as anybody else. Uh, some people are I enlisted, man. Yeah. I, I, I was the one who, who not only did it the first time, but it was two more times. It was just like, yeah, I mean, they're going to give me an extra $10,000 for I signed a seven-year contract years. without having spent a fucking day on active duty because I thought I wanted to be infantry that badly. I was an idiot. And my dad even said, don't do it. Like, you have no idea if you like the army or not. If you get to the four-year mark, you're going to feel like a real asshole if you could have gotten out, <laughs> but then they won't let you because you tacked on three years before you'd even started. And I was like, no, that's not true. That won't be me. I'm going to love being in the army. And then sure enough, what happened? I'm 18 I was like, and I know everything. Well, I was 21, but yeah. And I was like, and then it turns out, uh, no, I, I absolutely regretted it. And I thought I could get out in 2011. And they're like, nope, you're in until 2014, dickhead. Like... Yeah, it sucked. It was stupid. Fucking ugh. Yeah, don't do it. And like that will absolutely fuck you on technicalities on your contract. So like that's once these things I just say, like learn from our experience if you want. If you don't want to, at least go into it understanding they don't go have any illusions about it. Don't trust any of the things they promise you, so on and so forth. Get it in writing, etc. But I mean the safest way to avoid that is to not do it. Uh yeah, just just don't join. And if you absolutely must, go be a coastie. Go go join the Coast Guard. Yeah, Coast Guard they, uh, seems like the least problematic, to be honest with you. And that's not to say they're not I mean, problematic. It's just like in relative <laughs> terms. Like, certainly don't join the fucking Marine Corps. Like, being in the Marine Corps seems to be like, we will give you a moral injury and you will commit suicide. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fucked up, man. It's a weird, it's it's like a Heaven's Gate cult. Um, And I realize I'm really fucking dating myself with that reference. Uh, yeah, Heaven's Gate shit. Wasn't that like 98, 99 or something? Maybe even earlier yeah, than that. During yeah, during the, the year of Hale Bop. And, oh, yeah. Uh, well, Hale Bop was yeah. like 97. Fuck, yeah, that is really old, isn't it? Like, not, nothing nothing makes you feel hip and with the kids like a 25-year-old <laughs> reference. Welcome to the Olds cast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that was even before I joined the military. That was how fucking long, that, long ago that was. <laughs> Fuck, dude, 1997, like... Uh, 
I started seventh grade in the fall of 1997. Like, yeah, that was for These are the things, yeah, before before 9-11, these are the things that we had. And one of them was uh, a weird cult all murking themselves wearing really nice Nike Yeah, shoes they all, they, they took poison game. to basically, because they were going to join the hale Bob comet when it passed through and they all died there wearing was, like fly Nike. There was a spaceship. There's a spaceship hiding behind it, I believe. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And then, yeah, well, I was trying to think what's else. What other dumb shit? Like uh, El Nino jokes. That was a big one. Uh, what else? Um, uh, I mean, the 90s was big for um, Clinton uh, impeachment. Stuff oh, yeah. Lewinsky, Lewinsky jokes. Lewinsky. Yeah, exactly. Um, Monica Lewinsky is a goddamn treasure online right now, too. Um, Linda, Linda Tripp jokes. Yeah. Um, I, you know, uh, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. All that stuff. Yeah. Wow. All the cigars. Oof, yeah. God, that, I remember the Ken Starr report was like just horny as hell. Like just absolutely. That, thank goodness that my, man's dead. Cause he's very shit. dead. He's a huge piece of shit. <laughs> Apparently he did a, a whole lot of, uh, call it, um, uh, volunteer legal work when he was the, uh, I think it was provost of Baylor university to cover up a sexual assault scandal. Um, so yeah, Ken Starr, big big piece of shit. Um, rest in piss. Uh, he died recently, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think about that like, yeah, um, you know, talking about cults, man. Uh, we were recently passed some information. It was not just the fact that the Space Force has its own official song, but it's like this weirdly heartfelt sort of mini documentary about the making of the Space Force song. Um, the song is called Semper Supra, uh, which is just very very strange and always super. Is that what that means? I, always beyond, I think is what it means, but I could mm. be wrong. Uh, <laughs> what I would say is, um, okay, either, Semper either always Supreme beyond. is what, there we go. I'm going to make Semper Supreme. Uh, but you know what? Do you know what? How can I really mock them for being in a cult when 10 plus 12 years later, I still, if asked, could sing. We conquer the mountains and the valleys. We train in the winter's bitter cold. Alaska soldiers, Arctic warriors, centuries of the north. Dude, I fucking hated that shit. They made us sing that every fucking... God, so pick up your weapon and your snowshoes. We're ready to fight and to defend. Alaska soldiers, something, something from the last frontier. Like... Oh, fuck, man. They would make us sing that and the army song every morning at formation. Every morning we had to sing the song. The song that sounded like it was like written by Bing Crosby. Like it sounds like it was appearing like a like a fucking black and white reel to reel World War II documentary. Like it's so oh. there was also one for Korea and I can't even remember what it was. It was like the second ID song. And like no one ever learned it. No one ever learned the tunes. It was just like it was like you had auto-tuned a bunch of privates singing badly to just C flat. Like or rather just there is no C flat. So just like C, just like middle C, just, just auto tuned it down to just like, if you ever heard the, the video where they took smash mouths, all star and they just made every note in it C using auto tune. So it goes like somebody was told me the world was gonna roll me like that. That's what all these troops sounded like trying to sing this fucking stupid song because everyone hated being in Korea. No one wanted to be there. And then we had to sing um, the army song. What is it? Uh, da, da, first to fight for the right and to build the nation's might. And the army goes rolling along. And it was it was <sighs> originally the caissons. They kind of they kind of took a song and uh, made it into the army song. And they just kind of swapped some words around because the caissons is what you load all your ammunition on to drag it out to uh, <clears throat> to you know drag it out to your guns to go shoot them. Your big guns, the artillery stuff. So uh, so that got. So look, and, and and I'm a little upset that the the song uh, that the Space Force went with sounds like every other service song. Sounds like some dumb shit that was made in the '50s. But like you pointed out, this has to be something that is taught and sung by a bunch of people. Half of them who are hungover, the other half don't want to be there for their own personal reasons at, at you know six o'clock in the morning at a uh, you know at, at a inspection or something like that before having to do a PT test. This is the song that they need. It's something quick. It's something everybody can sing in a flat C and then we can all move along with our lives and make fun of it later on. Dude, the singing, no one told me how much fucking singing there would be in you the army. You gotta sing so much in the army. What the fuck? I mean, like cadences, like, cadences, if someone can sing a cadence well, then it's fun in the moment. Like here and there, you'll meet people who are good at singing cadences. Uh, editors note they are normally not white 
and <laughs> like you get really really good good Kate like it's it can be fun to be you can get, actually genuinely get motivated um killing the baby seal is one of the songs i remember they made us sing in alaska um fucking all the really really problematic ones like they cut out the sexual problematic ones but they still made you sing ones that basically were like i love murdering children like 100 percent. some of these fucking cadences um you mean you mean napalm sticks to kids was uh not as they say woke yeah yeah um what i what i did find funny though i had a friend who had been a drill sergeant and he had been a med an enlisted medic and then um he went officer and he had a lot of uh, really, really like kind of bitter ones, if you could put it like funny but bitter cadences. And um, you know, you know, she she was it. She wore a yellow ribbon that cadence. Yeah. And um, <laughs> around her head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She so wore his, a yellow his ribbon. version was yeah. around the block. She drove a yellow Corvette. She drove it in the springtime in the merry month of May. And if you asked her how the hell she bought it power of attorney he was far far away <laughs> far away far away power of attorney he was far far away and that to me is way more of a truthful retelling of the army experience for those of you who are not aware who are wondering what is it that i am singing that's making francis laugh is that uh when you leave when you go on deployment you typically are required to sign over a general power of attorney which lets someone sign for you for things I gave one to my parents, uh, but many soldiers will give them to their spouses of like two weeks because they meet a girl in the strip club and they get married a week before deployment. They come back, their bank account's been cleared out. They have a ton of car loans taken out in their name, so on and so forth. This is a, a common common phenomenon amongst idiot, very, very young soldiers and officers uh, who basically have not figured out that uh, it might not be true love. It may just be an opportunity for the person involved. Um, this is this is genuinely a thing that happens a lot. So in in in, in his song, uh, he has he has re- repurposed this. I, I've over explained the joke, but uh, just in case you didn't get what made that funny, um, songs about Jody. Jody is this amorphous agender person who fucks your spouse or significant other while you're gone. They can be male or female. They can be non-binary. They could be they could be any gender. And Jody as a yeah. name works really well in that regard. But the uh, only the, the only um, time that the that people in the army are perfectly fine with a they them is Jody it's because Jody. they are fucking all of our girlfriends or boyfriends. Yeah, basically, Whoever, you go whichever... to the field for a month. Jody's got got your your partner, got your spouse, got your significant other. Uh, you go on deployment. Jody's for sure got them. Uh, this is yeah. There is there is no like hey, jo- Jody got one of mine, so I get it. Actually, Jody's gotten gotten a couple girl- girlfriends of mine. <laughs> Fucking Jody. Have I been That's Jody? Right. Maybe. I don't know. I, might, I feel I might. like anybody because you were active duty, so you probably may have been accidentally Jody. Like maybe, maybe you weren't told that somebody was uh, married and looking for a little fling. I don't know. I don't know your history, but uh, I have heard that that sometimes happens. I have. Um, it's not your fault if the information hasn't been given to you. Um, I have never right, been because UCMJ definitely cares about that. They will <laughs> definitely be like, "Oh, you didn't know? Well, then we're not going to punish you for adultery. You didn't know. You, you're not at fault we, for this. We're famously fair and even-handed in the uniform code of military justice. But we wait won't a minute, sentence a fucking private to break rocks for twelve hours a day. We don't do that. Doesn't adultery only count if you're married? So if you're the single, if you're the Jody and you're single. And it's not you're you're not going to get. Have, I mean, legally, you if you're be an officer, it's still conduct unbecoming. Well, yeah, I mean, don't be an officer would be. It, yeah, you like, can don't go join in. the army, but if you must, don't be an officer. <laughs> See, but then other people would be like, no, be an officer because you get sweet privileges. Which, like, yes, you do, but also there's other things like, for example, your your uh, your hooking up options are legally limited in the sense that you that. <laughs> and God, there are so many people that are just full on like sexual pocket watchers. If that analogy makes sense, that if they know that you're hooking up with someone, you've got something going on, they're just mad and they're like, I'm going to dime this person out and fucking get them in trouble. Like, it can be. Dude, that happened. That happened so much on my deployments. People get mad that, like, I, and so on my first deployment in Afghanistan, there was no sex allowed, like, none whatsoever, unless you were married. And I actually did know, like, there was a, I knew of at least you one. You had to be married couple. and you have to be deployed together. Yes. You, you you were only allowed to have sex. <laughs> it's, it, it's not like, oh, you you're married, you can fuck anyone you want. Like you can <laughs> you can have sex with your spouse if they're also in the army and deployed with you. However, right. otherwise you can't uh you can't uh have any sex whatsoever because general order number one, which is sort of like the central command guideline, said that you could not 
have sex. You could not drink alcohol. And originally, you couldn't consume any pork products. You couldn't have any pornography either. They stopped enforcing the pork and the porno ones, but they definitely continued to enforce the alcohol and sex ones. But even that, only to a certain degree. Because when I went to Iraq in 2009, um, the, the, the TM, TMP, the Troop Medical... Um, is that what it's? Troop Medical Clinic? TMC. Yeah, the TMC. Tro- tro- Troop Medical Clinic, yeah. Clinic, yeah. Uh, they had fish bowls of condoms out and stuff. You know, there's like, look, we know you guys are going to fuck. Just, you know, stay within your lanes. Stay I mean, within, my, like... My, my, my first sergeant's take on this was to privates and junior soldiers was like, look, if you can get some ass, get some ass. Don't let me find out about it. Because if I find out about it, I have to do something about it. And what me doing something about it means is you getting UCMJ for violating general order number one, and chances are really good you're going to get busted down to E1 and serve with extra duty. And you'll probably get discharged from the army when we get back. So we will definitely keep you in combat until we come home and then we'll kick you out without any benefits. So if you can get some, by all means, get some as long as you can get away with it. But if you aren't that slick, don't put yourself in that position. And I feel like that's a pretty good way of saying it because it's like at the end of the day, humans are human. Uh, it's unnatural to be in that situation, but I, that's that's a way of playing the game without being like, a, oh, I'm so fucking mad that this guy's getting laid and I'm not, so I'm gonna fucking dime him out. Like, yeah, you know, that's gross. But it's also like with officers and shit, like it's it's different because we can only have sex with other officers, and typically speaking, like it's frowned upon for us to hook up with officers who are junior in rank to us. Although it is allowed, it's still they can't be in your chain of command. But we cannot, under any circumstances, have relationships with NCOs or enlisted soldiers, and so. um what that basically means is no sex for LT, no sex for the CO. It just doesn't happen. Like because in an infantry unit back in those days, they're like there, you might have one single female officer assigned, but like to a battalion. Right. Um, it, so if it, that's the love not, of your life, then s- fucking hell yeah, man, go for it. But otherwise, it's like you, you know, the chances are good that like y'all aren't going to be attracted to each other. It's just not going to happen. You know what I mean? And you just, I mean, you just don't have uh like now however if you join the infantry and you're you know gay or bisexual you're probably going to have a lot more uh chances there um you know not a lot of no i remember one of the poor uh oh. this poor guy that i knew that was a um uh fuck, what, he, wor- he worked in public affairs he had moved over from infantry and like had just moved over from infantry into public affairs this man was you know probably about 20 i want to say 22 23 he was a little bit younger than me at the time and uh, completely scared of women. Could not could not speak to women uh, because he was in the infantry. He's just like I. He's like I'm afraid that if I say anything to any any female soldier, I'm going to get dimed out for um, sexual harassment. I was like, that's it's not really how a little works. fucked up. I don't know who's been telling you uh, these kinds of things. Um, just be normal. Just be a person, and uh, I mean, you'll be fine. just be normal is a very tall order for a lot of dudes in the <laughs> yeah, army. Let's be honest. It really is. But yeah, I mean. Um, God, I just remember I had a, one of our paralegals was gay and it was pre don't ask, don't tell. But like, if you could uh, hear sound or sense vibrations or see with your eyes, you would immediately clock that he was gay. And I felt really bad because like some of like the straight soldiers would just like flirt with him and stuff because of like, hey, can you like, hey, you want to hang out? Also, can you tell me when they're planning the next piss test and stuff like that? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it was, it was really like, never, never, never underestimate how much homophobia can be fucking cashiered for an opportunity to get away with doing drugs. I just imagine just like, damn, we did, we did blow. Somebody has got to go like suck the LT's dick so we can get away with it. No, it was, he was a fucking paralegal. He was like a PFC. He just <laughs> knew when the commander Jesus. was planning it. Cause he had to be like on the thing. Like that stuff's oh, yeah. not secret. Like unit prevention leaders can absolutely leak that shit if they want. I mean, they do all the oh, time. Yeah. yeah. No, I was gonna come fucking suck my dicks and get away with fucking doing <laughs> drugs. Man, what are you talking about? That never well, look, happened. I didn't... <laughs> no, I mean genuinely never happened. I, I, uh, I, I never had. I mean that that paralegal made it kind of kind of clear to me that if I wanted it, we could hook up. But I was like, bro, like, uh, no, that's just that, for a million reasons, no. Uh, but I never, I actually never had any kind of encounter in which I felt as though. I, I mean, I'm I'm really famously bad at being able to pick up on things like that, but um. I didn't have that at all in my first unit. I did have it in Honduras because a lot of people were civil, um, were reservists. And so it was just sort of like, all of this is just kayfabe most of the time anyway. Um, so definitely there was just like a lot of 
attractive female NCOs there. And so like got to know people, got how we, we could drink. Like you got, you, there were, there were definitely moments when it was kind of revealed to me that the possibility existed, but like, um, but I was just like, this yeah. is not a good, this is not a good idea. Don't no, like, don't if do you're going to be in, if you, if you're going to join the army and you're going to do this stuff, don't fuck yourself up in the army because like the, the benefits that you get post military, like once you get out, even if you only do four years is better than the, than nothing because uh, you, decided to oh but they will 100 percent kick you out for this 100 percent kick you out for oh, this yeah. shit and i this should you know what nate they should use this as recruiting tactics like now they should be like hey if you go on deployment now you can fuck anybody we don't care but also like, you like grow beard, straight you up bone how many times did you see this happen because ha- i saw it all the time that like female soldiers who got pregnant got punished for general order number one stuff and would get kicked out of the army and like depending on how vindictive the commanders were like in some cases they fully like court-martialed them uh when i was in korea because in korea you abortion was illegal in the nation of Korea and the army can't provide abortions. So girls who got pregnant while they were stationed in Korea had no options. And like, I saw a number of, of female soldiers who like wanted to stay in the military getting kicked out because of family care plan. And like, if you're, if your command was in vindictive, if, if you got pregnant in Iraq or Afghanistan, they would a hundred percent try to like fucking hit you with UCMJ, which meant not only were you losing your job and uh, being forced to carry a child to term, you were, I mean, assuming you didn't want to, uh, you also would be kicked out with no, no veterans benefits. Um, I know a number of, uh, there were, there were a number of, they assigned a bunch of, of female medics to my battalion, to our brigade, because they wanted to have every aid station on every cop have at least one female medic who could treat female patients and like civilians who came in for stuff. Cause obviously sure. in Afghanistan, like there's a huge taboo against, uh, even in the case of doctors, uh, men treating women medically, or at least there was in like rural southeastern Afghanistan. It's just and, easier. And it's so, a, it, and like obviously for the not all the women uh, who they were assigned were straight, but for the ones who were, like obviously, like soldiers are not subtle about being like, oh, do you want some garbage dick? Like it's basically a hot dog you found <laughs> on the ground outside, but like you can have it. <laughs> and so, and I just recall like the kind of call it like the the vigor with which some of these commanders went after like prosecuting these girls under UCMJ because people knew they were having sex. Like it was it was genuinely I was like, man, you guys are such fucking losers. Like obviously it's, you can't you can't be like having fucking gangbangs in the bee hut, but like, you know, like the degree to which you make this your business is such a it's so ugh, like there's so many other things that if you wanted to be this much of a martinet about things you could go after people for like the wastage and the theft and like the general incompetence but you have to draw the line in sex sex is the thing that makes you so fucking mad that other people are having it that you're like i'm gonna ruin all their lives because they're not having it that's what it comes down to right but you're but uh, you're right but like i mean okay but i mean (laughs) if general order number one weren't in effect you'd also not be having sex like <laughs> fair enough most most but of us let's be perfectly honest yeah we i remember we had um uh a gal in when i was in iraq uh I, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna put names out she was great um she was a, a videographer um loved her to death uh an attractive blonde uh young woman and um she was like she would go hang out with like the dog handlers like uh the the guys who handled the the military working dogs and like, you know, if you if you're deployed and you handle dogs, women are going to come like it'd be it'd be if we still had like cavalry that still had horses and you were like a horse guy, you'd get all the horse ladies, um, you know, crawling after you. But this guy, this guy that she was kind of uh, hanging out with was just a massive loser. Like I, he had no personality other than um, I have washboard abs and I have access to dogs. And like he would get so upset, like when she was just like, yeah, I kind of end, end things because like. He got really upset when I was like, she was kind of talking about like, you know, you're mobilizing back home. I'm staying here. Obviously, this is not going to continue. So, and he's just, he like lifted up his shirt. Like, what was all this for then? Like washboard abs. She's like, I don't fucking know, dude. What? what was there, there, there are a lot of dudes that get really hung up on the idea that, um, that like you have to have, you have to look like a street fighter figurine or no girls are going to talk to you. <laughs> and I feel like you and I are both case studies in the fact that like that is not the case you can you can look i mean like, look, you, Nate, look like, you and i are not you and i are not like you know unattractive hogs though let's let's be that's honest that's true like, I mean, when we were in our prime in the 20 in our 20s you and i were both hot i'm just going to assume that um 
Yeah, I but I mean, I like, was. but I, I definitely think that um, my, uh, my, I think that I had more success down the road because I sort of like life experiences kind of forced me to have some perspective to be less of an asshole and to develop something of a personality. And I think that even though I don't look the way that I did when I was in my call it physical prime, like I wasn't exactly cleaning up back then because I just like didn't really have a particularly attractive personality. And I genuinely think that there's, I mean, if you go into any kind of things like incel forums or like men's hair loss forums, you see this insane <laughs> catastrophizing about how like no one will find you attractive. It's like, bro, like. My favorite is, you, did you read the, or at least did you see the article about like, Tech bros getting leg lengthening surgeries. And I, stuff. Did, I did. I did. I thought. I thought it was funny. Somebody. Because... Some. Some. Well, just some like incel dude was just like, oh well. I mean, this you know goes to prove that uh, you know guys are having to go to all these uh, all these limits to like you know have a woman have sex with them because the first thing she's looking at is like you know uh, how breedable are you? And like, man, if a tech bro with with enough money to get leg lengthening surgery out of pocket can't get laid, that is that man. That man's height is not a problem. I remember that this is, article about just, uh, the guy who founded Bustle.com because he decided he was going to start a, like a women's news site. Um, <laughs> he had had a lot of monetary success with BleacherReport.com and he decided okay, he was going to kind one. of like parlay that same model of basically paying writers next to nothing but hiring lots of them and just have endless, endless content. And this article featured, you know, the, 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 the writer went with him when he was meeting with potential investors and they were like, who's going to be the managing director of the site was one of the questions that came up. And the guy kind of shrugged. He's like, wait, it's not you, is it? Like, and they just laughed at him because according to the author, the guy dressed in uh, he, like a really baggy polo and really baggy jeans and like skateboarding shoes, even though he was well into his 30s. And, and the author described him as like looking like a six foot one, six year old. <laughs> and <laughs> there was an extent to which it's just like, yeah, man. I mean, there is obviously some basic stuff that really does matter, but that's not that's not genetics. That's not like that's that's basic grooming and hygiene kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, and that that's not really like it's not as though you have to be blessed with perfect DNA to know to like shower and wash your hair and go to the barber periodically and shave unless you like even if you have a beard, you still have to shave. You still have to fucking like I have I have facial hair. I shave probably once every two weeks to just like shape things up. Otherwise, I look like a fucking white Taliban. Like, I look like a dude that fucking got rolled up in like Uzbekistan trying to do jihad and he's from like Peoria, Illinois. Like, I looking know like, that about myself. Looking like a Chechenian um, jihadist. Yeah, exactly. I look like fat John Walker Lind. Like, except he could grow a way bigger beard than me. Like, flat out. That's just, that's just basic stuff. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we can go on and on about, I mean, it is very strange the way that people get in their own heads about, uh, you know, if you don't have X, then you'll never get anything in life. And it's like, I mean, I I have oh you know, I've been on this planet almost thirty eight years. It'll be by the time this episode comes out, it'll be like a week until my birthday. Um and uh, you know, I've been been around a bit and the thing that I have discovered is that a lot of it is just whether or not you are someone who is like there's no enormous red flags that make you like dangerous or repulsive. And by which I mean like stuff you can control instantaneously like grooming and the way you smell and like whether or not you are like you act in ways that would make people think you're threatening or dangerous uh whether that's like physically violent or like creepy and sexual in general like those are things that are easily within within your control the rest is just like do you get along with people and like do you do you seem like someone who's fun to be around genuinely like that's it's just like kind of like being fun to hang out with I mean, this isn't the Manosphere podcast. This isn't us telling uh, telling you how to how to how to how to how to clean up and you know how to be like a fucking pickup artist. But I think the big thing that I've sort of observed over time is that it doesn't really like there are so many examples of people that I've met where you have these combinations where they're just you know like kind of uh, you'd think they were implausible, but it's like no, they really enjoy spending time together, and it's like that's really it. It really just comes down to like does that other person that you're interested in enjoy spending time with you? And like, yeah, there's some dumb shit. And I think the internet makes things terrible in terms of people like leaking stuff and sharing stuff online and being weird, filming people without their consent, screenshotting without people's consent, stuff like that. But like, I don't think that the fundamentals of how one goes about like, you know, expressing attraction are like so generationally different that no one could recognize them now. Now, that being said, I don't want to be single anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad that I'm married. I'm very happily married. And that, that, 
that fucking whips. I, I presume you feel the same. It is. Um, I, I, you know, have been actually, we just, my wife and I just had our 10 year anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. So, and in, in fitting, uh, you know, fitting for the both of us, we completely kind of forgot about it. Um, we always forget about it when it comes around until like afterwards, like nine, honestly, nine 11 <laughs> reminds me like, Oh shit. My wedding anniversary was two days ago. Uh, oh, fuck. But- so basically like if they had just done nine 11, a few days earlier, then you would have an early warning system. Right. Well, the, the plan was I got back from Iraq on September 10th, uh, 2000 fucking 2010. So uh, we were trying to get married on that date because that's I came home and she and I started dating um, after that. So we were kind of but, you know, time it was like the 10th was going to be on a Monday and I didn't have a job where it was easy for me to take off at that point. So we just did it the day before. But, um, yeah, it it fucking it it whips ass to have somebody who um, you're just comfortable with and who, like, you know, like, you, you know, all of their all of their little things, the things that make their, uh, that makes them work. You know, here's, here's a great thing about being married that, um, I did not really realize like when I was single and, um, you know, fucking around, sleeping around as one does when they're, you know, 23 and alcoholic and depressed, um, you know exactly what to do. And then, then, you know, and there's no guesswork. There's no, there's nothing. It's just, it's there. And then you can go to doing what you guys want to do, what else you, you want to do. And, um, my wife actually told me about a thing, uh, because she's, our, our daughter is being evaluated for, um, for, you know, being on the autistic, um, spectrum. And so my wife does a lot of, uh, research in it cause she's kind of on the spectrum herself, just in a different way. And, uh, she was talking about this thing called parallel play where, you know, you're not, you don't necessarily have to be doing something together, but you're doing your own things next to each other. And that is like a form, like the, uh, a form of intimacy that, you know, is not really kind of talked about, or maybe that people just don't really realize very often to have that kind of comfort of, I could like, and, and I could, I could at any point in time, I could go downstairs in the basement and play video games if I wanted to, or, um, you know, go into my office and work on stuff like, because usually after the kid goes to bed, that's our like couple of hours to, you know, hang out. Uh, but I don't like, I feel uncomfortable doing that stuff. Like I want to be near her. And then I know that she wants me to be around too. And you know, like one, you know, one night or two nights, like obviously we record podcasts on Thursday nights and it's not that big of a deal. But like, if I was just kind of removing myself from that situation completely, you're going to miss out on a lot of stuff. So it's, uh, it's all those little, like those little things that like you really don't understand until you're, you know, in as deep, like 10 years into a marriage that you're still happy with and you're still enjoying. And to, uh, to really kind of understand that, uh, (laughs) all the TV shows were fucking lying to you and all the, all these, like the boomer memes of my bitch wife. It's just like, you should probably divorce that person. Yeah. You should, you shouldn't be in that relationship anymore. So you should be happy to say like, and look, you, you want to get away from people. Certainly I, you know, enjoy my time to myself, but i my wife was just out of town for like four days and I was single parenting that time. Usually if my wife goes out of town, she takes Lily this time she didn't. And so I had to be the single dad and, uh, holy shit. I never want to do that. Like as you know, I don't mind doing it for like a week on occasion, but I don't want that to be my life. No, I mean, uh, it would be, it would be very difficult without, um, without her. So, yeah. So it'll be seven years together for us in December and six years married. Cause we, uh, we, we, we started dating and then we got married a year later and ours is very easy to remember because to, our to anniversary the day of being, uh, DM'd not of day of being DM'd, but the day that we actually like met up in person after deciding ah. from afar, talking to one another a lot that we wanted to be together. Uh, and that is the day before new year. So, so it's very easy for me to remember, to be honest with you. I just, I think about it too. Sometimes that, uh, yeah, it's weird how if you can. I mean, I I think there was a there was a post I saw years ago that I remember laughing at where a guy was like, "I'm going to give you like more or less the tools of the trade if you want to be attractive to women. Like, you have to wear clean clothes. You need to do your laundry. Like, eat, wear clothes once and then wash them. Like, you know, if you live in America, like that's not hard. So just do that. Um, your clothes should at least fit. You don't have to be like a, like a fucking fashion machine, but like they should at least fit like size be sized well enough not too tight not too not too baggy on you like don't look like you've outgrown your clothes and don't look like you know you're you 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 you're going to grow into your older brother's clothes 
Um, you know, there's a certain degree of like whether or not things look appropriate. Like you don't necessarily wear clothes you'd wear to a basketball court to like the bar or to like a dinner with friends. Um, you know, you should probably find some kind of exercise you like. Um, realistically speaking, like the gym helps a lot if you're trying to lose weight, but realistically, like it doesn't have to be insane. Just if you find something that works for you and you do it a couple times a week, like you know, at at a, at a minimum probably six months, at a maximum probably three years. Like you'll see changes and you'll feel better. And like go to a barber, go to the barber at least once a month. Get your hair, you know, trimmed it away. Like wash your hair at least once a week. Brush your teeth twice a day. Like do these things and like. And when you meet people, when you meet as a guy, if you meet women, like you know, your goal should be when you're talking is just sort of like give them an opportunity to talk about themselves and ask questions that let them think you're interested and also like like you know they they feel comfortable telling you about themselves. And this was just like a guy kind of winging it, doing a threat. But I could, I was so funny seeing all of like the responses and quote tweets from women being like, God, does this guy exist in real life? Cause he sounds so hot. <laughs> it's just like, notice that there was no specification of you must have every single fucking hair follicle you were born with. You must have washboard abs. You must be insanely rich. You must be at least six feet tall. Like none of that, none of that really applies. I've seen, I've seen, dude, I've seen some short people, some short dudes like, um, and, and actually I remember, uh, not too long ago, there was, um, so our science center does this thing called First Friday. They're open late. They have a theme, like kind of a science fiction-y theme. The last one that we went to was Princess Bride. And they had sword fighting demonstrations from like a local fencing group. And uh, one of the guys who was on it was, you know, a dude who's probably about like maybe 5'8 or 5'9. Or um, a little, you know, not, you know, a little on the shorter side. On that side where like some dudes would be like, Oh, I got to go get that leg leg lengthening surgery. And that dude had so much fucking swagger, maybe because he was a sword fighter and uh, he got to get up there and do sword fighting stuff and he was enjoying himself. But like, man, there's some dudes that like it, it really comes down like you can be short and it doesn't matter because one of my best friends but, from home is five, six, and he's basically never been single <laughs> like because he just has a fun personality and like he's a fun guy to be around. Like, yeah. and it's always worked for him. I mean, I think it helped that, you know, he lived in a place where there were lots of uh, you know, he's straight and there were a lot of women of his age doing stuff of like a similar background. He lived in, in DC for a long time and then in Philly. And like, that's a great place to be. Like when you've got people, you know, your own age, you know, in similar sort of like life circumstances, that does help. It's certainly easier being single in a, a major city. You know, if you've got, if you're doing okay to like have, you know, money and, and time than it is in like the middle of fucking nowhere. But I mean, it really like any of those truisms that people put out there. Like I'm not saying like I'm going to write a, you know, dating for dummies book and I can tell you exactly how to solve whatever problem you've got. But what I will say is like a lot of these things that, that people want to cast this kind of fatalism and say that you're doomed because of X genetic factor. Like it's just not in my experience. That is not true. And I, I also, I feel like when, when somebody kind of puts something out, like uh, you have to have this and you have to have that to be attractive they're also evaluating, you know, they're evaluating their possible mates on some insane scale that they've also sure. encountered. And sure. not just like, and not just like, do you enjoy being around this person? If yes, then cool. If no, then fuck off and do something yeah, else. Yeah. And like also, it's, it's just a question too of like, who are you actually attracted to? Like, that's the thing is just be honest about what you're, you know, because none of those, none of those things like, guys who who love to talk that stuff are always about like I'm dating like a fucking supermodel and shit. It's like whatever, man. Like one of my one of my good friends from the army's wife is I wouldn't say like a supermodel, but like is like a big enough like model in a big enough agency that like she's been a model her entire life post college. She's worked for like any any insanely high fashion brand you can think of she's done it. She like owns her own place in midtown Manhattan. Like she's very, very successful. And like she didn't really get a lot of time to do stuff for fun. She's always flying around going to fashion shows and shoots and shit like that. Like, you know, like, but through being friends with him and her, like I met a lot of her friends who are also models. And I met a lot of guys who were dating models. And like most of it was because like, they just liked being around each other and had fun. Like it had nothing to do with like, this guy must be like one guy I met was like a fucking programmer. Like he, he looked like he, I mean, like he, he kept himself in decent shape, but he was by no means like holding, being held to some insane standard. He was just like a funny Australian dude who was like fun to be around. And literally that was, a, he's dating like a fucking professional model. Who's like, you know, <laughs> posing for like Yves Saint Laurent stuff. Like it worked for him. Like just not being weird. And I don't mean like you're genetically predestined to be weird. I just mean like not being, not making people uncomfortable. It's amazing. 
whatever difference that makes. And so like, you know, I, I always, I always told my single friends when I, you know, it's just like the way that I met women and dated women was I, you know, and this is back in the days before, you know, uh, Tinder. So obviously you have to go out and meet people and things like that. But it just came down to just like, just, you know, be, be your, be a, a person that, you know, you would want to be around and then it works. Stop, stop trying to have sex. Stop trying stop going into this. Like, we're going to go to the bar and we're going to get laid. Just go to the bar and have fun. And like, if you get laid, great. But if not, don't let that, don't let that ruin your day. Don't go in there with a mission statement. Like it's Friday night. Just enjoy yourself. One of my good friends from the writing program I was in started going bald when he was 24 and he's pretty heavy set. He's covered in tattoos and he's now completely bald. And He's a bartender, like professionally now, in a, in a bar that's pretty popular in 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 um uh in part part of Brooklyn that's like you no, know, not not like cop Brooklyn, but like like kind of more 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 fun hip Brooklyn. Put it put it that way. Without be, it's not like fucking Williamsburg or or, or Bushwick. Um, bro, that guy cleans up like nobody's business. You know why? <laughs> because for one, he's pouring the drinks, but for another, because like because he just his job is to pour you drinks and to listen to you. And like the degree to which that man cleans, like it is. It is the kind of stuff that like they'd fucking write in like a compendium about Rodrigo Borgia and like 15th century popes level of shit like that guy. I mean, he's I think he's dating someone now, but like the amount of shit that guy could get up to because like, yeah, do you know why? It wasn't because he met like the sort of manosphere requirements of what you're supposed to look like, but his job has him around lots and lots of 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 people and like he has to have people skills and that makes you attractive to people. Genuinely, it's it's it defies all the manosphere fucking rules. So what does that tell you? It sort of seems to imply you. that like maybe it's not so cut and dry and maybe it's just more to do with like how well you can get along with people. And uh, you know, like my soldiers, who boy, did they ever take the approach of like, we are going out, we're getting drunk as fuck and we're going to have sex. And like many of them did in fact have sex. Was it good sex? And did it lead to good consequences in their lives? No, it didn't. <laughs> so like i don't know you know i mean like i've i've been that guy in like the shitty bar at 3 a.m and i've been that guy who's like managed to clean up pretty well at least like like you know amongst friends like getting to be friends with people and especially in situations where had i lived in the places i was hanging out with friends in like it would have had a much easier time i think dating because like just being someone who's fun to be around like and just making people feel comfortable that's genuinely like the best way to go about it it's amazing it's amazing. And, and, and I don't know, I don't think any, uh, you're not doing yourself any favors by reading stuff that makes you feel bad about yourself. But also like, I do think that some things are non-negotiable and like taking a fucking shower is non-negotiable. Yeah. Be normal. That's uh that, that's the, just uh, want you to be normal. All right. We are your dads anything. and we're telling you be normal. No, I mean, like I, we I, understand, we understand that probably we have a lot of people who are like in their thirties who listen to this. Uh, so if you have some younger generation kids that you need to sit down, strap down like clockwork orange, to make them listen to a podcast, uh, this is the one the, where we make fun of the Space Force and then we tell them to be normal. But that's the thing too that I'll say, my, my final point on this, I, when I was younger and I was in much better shape, and I think that you could ostensibly say, okay, like when you're ranking how, how attractive this person is by the standards of my sort of age cohort, I think I, I would have looked, you know, I, I think I, 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 I looked good. I had no idea how to talk to women. I had no idea how to approach women. And I think I was kind of standoffish and it made girls feel not uncomfortable, like safety uncomfortable, but more like this conversation isn't going anywhere because I was so bad at like being just like fun to talk to. And maybe it was the experience of being in the army and just being surrounded by fucking dudes all the time that like I kind of got over that. It's like, <laughs> oh, oh, you're, you're, you're nice. Like, you know, we can talk, you know, that kind of thing. And also maybe it's just Asian experience. I think Asian experience helps a lot. But the thing I want yeah. to say is that uh, there is... Un unfortunately, if you're 25, you're going to be stupid for a while still. Yeah, you are. Because I mean, when I look back on where I was at that age, I was really stupid. So, I mean, quite frankly, you, uh, be, you know, you, maturity helps a lot. But uh, I would say just, you know, like, you know, my goals are... Uh, I, I, I don't think I'm going to get to do this, um, this Olympic triathlon until we get to Switzerland, but I'm still training, trying to like lower my, uh, my 5k time and just like be able to run. One of my goals is to be able to get back into, um, I want to be able to run five miles in under 40 minutes and keep my heart rate below 150. That's not easy. 
that's the standard for ranger school, which I'm, I'm pretty sure I could do now, or I'd be pretty close to it if I, if I, you know, had my heart rate fucking pr- pushing 190 or some shit. But my goal is to be able to do that. And I've got a couple of book projects and I want to actually stick to my like daily and weekly writing goals and get some stuff done. And there's one in particular that I'm trying to actually, you know, shepherd towards being published. Those are my goals. Other than that, like, you know, try to stay off social media, don't get mad online, spend time with my wife, cook a lot of good meals, you know, try to get out of the house every day, walk every day at least, if not doing other exercise. Like, that's where my goals are. You know what I mean? I'm like, shit's working out okay for me. So I mean, like, you know, maybe you have to revise what your expectation is, but like all I can say is Look, Nate, I've been told that you can't get always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. <laughs> What's what song is that? It's escaping me. Uh you can't always get what you want. Oh, by whom? By the Rolling Stones. Ah, well, I'm not really a Rolling Stones <laughs> listener. Although I will say Exile on Main Street's a great album. Uh but you know what? Here's the thing that I would say, which is that uh Right, but you also may find that the thing you think you want is not necessarily what you wind up finding important down the road. There are great examples of this that I could tell you that are applicable to me when I was younger, but I think the best example I can give you now, obviously, this is a big drop off because, like, when you're a kid, you, you, you change a lot by the time you become a teenager and then an adult. I, while I was going through some shit, found my old diary from when I was in middle school. And one of the entries, I really wanted to save up money to be able to buy a TV and a DVD player so I could buy my favorite movie on DVD, Tommy Boy. <laughs> now, I'm not 12 anymore and Tommy Boy is not my favorite movie anymore, but I fucking wanted that DVD and a DVD it's player It's still a so good fucking movie though. Badly. That's it. We're watching Tommy Boy. For- <laughs> <laughs> so all I'm saying is that what it is that you think is desperately important to you will probably change. As time goes on, that has been my experience. And me and Francis are your dads. We would know. Need to listen to us. Go tell your mother that you love her. Tell your mom you love her. Uh, Try to get to bed on time because lack of sleep isn't really good. Staring at the screen isn't going to give you fucking any more enjoyment after a certain point. And uh, you should be reading like the the 15 minutes before bed. You should be reading a book or a magazine or something. That's I've I've always found that that's the best sleep that I get. I have an academic history. It's a book about uh, the one of the great famines. And I think it was the 13th or 14th century in medieval Europe. Super detailed about how they calculate like stuff with, you know, crop failures and flooding and all these things. Very, very deeply researched academic history. It puts me the fuck to sleep. And it's great. (laughs) Read about, you know, flooding in Flanders in 1389. And I'm like, whoop, time for bed. However, we have some bonus content I want to preview for you. This is, uh, we did a, a special appearance where I'm helping Shox finally get his own show. Shox and his co-host, Tom, uh, present the Irish and Irish American perspectives on things and uh, go to bat over uh, each other's communities. So this show is called The 33rd County. We are debuting it on Hell of a Way's feed. And in this first episode, I made Shox and Tom watch the Ben Affleck movie, The Town, and talk about it. Uh, and so I'm going to play a clip of that. And all the guys are like, oh, we install like security or ele- electric or some shit like that. And you look at something like Goodfellas, it's a world apart. Well, and I think that's, I think that's very particular to, you know, that is very particular to the kind of, you know, that kind of ephemeral Boston Irish in particular identity. You know, and kind of, you know, and just, you know, kind of is an undercurrent that carries through, you know, Red Sox, Yankees games or whatever else, you know, and compared to like, you know, the big glitz and glittering of New York City, you know, Boston, you know, there's kind of like this sense of always kind of, you know, right or wrong, always punching above your own weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and this kind of idea that, you know, uh, like even through like the underworld and like the, the reality of the underworld and, you know, Boston through the 60s and 70s and 80s and whatever, you know, you always did have the mafia. And for a long time, the mafia was supreme really up until you know, uh, Billy Bulger got the FBI to eliminate them for him or not Billy, sorry, Whitey. And, uh, you know, and then kind of, you know, but there was this kind of like always like a chip on the shoulder, even if it's not actually there. And, uh, you know, and I think that really is something that, you know, but, and part of that is definitely this kind of class aspect, but, you know, this idea that, you know, uh, the rest of these guys are kind of this more, this organized, you know, this organization yeah, or whatever yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is kind of just something where, you know, we're all gangsters who just happen to share like an ethnic identity. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
there's no real like organizing structure to it right. outside of the fact that they're all Irish Americans. Right. And and that's why I think you see these kind of less authentic attempts to bring it back to kind of the, you know, uh to Ireland itself because, you know, if you're just a bunch of assholes who happen to, you know, have vaguely Irish parentage uh and you're all doing crime together, that's one thing. But if you can grind it and saying like, well, you know, there's this kind of, there's this ethnic bond and we're doing it with the way our grandfathers did or something, whatever else, then you're kind of creating, you know, you're creating that originating, you know, mythos, you know, that's, you know, kind of makes it seem like it has a higher purpose. What we need to establish is the Irish American La Cosa Nostra, which I suppose we we will probably do Gangs of New York maybe in the future if, uh, yeah. if we, we look into this a bit more, but you know, th- there's some really, really iconic scenes in the movie. I think the best one is... I need your help. I can't tell you what it is. You can never ask me about it later, and we're going to hurt some people. Whose car we going to take? Like, absolute Irish-American excellence. Like, pure <laughs> dirtbag shit. And, like, I think, you know, if, if you're from Boston or um, if you just like hardcore, I feel like the two of us are going to talk a lot about hardcore just in general because there is like a big kind of Irish American aspect to it. We mentioned like Flogging Molly and Dropkick Murphys and stuff. But that is like they rock into the dude's house because they he was harassing uh, the bank manager. Her name's Claire. And they just like kick the shit out of him wearing hockey masks. Obviously, being very true to form, uh, Ben Affleck's character Doug used to be, you know, a hockey prospect as well. But he got fucked out because he robbed a place with a nail gun. <laughs> well, and even the uh, you know the the line at the beginning of that where they uh, they call a sledgehammer the townie credit card uh, because that's how they're gonna that's how they're gonna get in through the front door. You know, like they knock on it and then as soon as he uh, unbolts it and just has the chain, they just knock it in on him. There's there's a lot really to be said for you know like actually I kind of want to ask how really authentic is it to like your interaction with guys who say they might be playing what do you mean essentially like say like jeremy renner's character i'm sure there's like dudes who run around who are pretty much like him but you know how common is it pretty much uh well i mean one of the things that i will say and you know i'm gonna you know as i kind of preface all like i you know, I grew up around Boston. I'm not, you know, from any of these neighborhoods. And I, I only preface that stolen because valor, I, stolen valor. I do have a lot of, well, you know, so I do actually have a lot of friends that I, uh, you know, grew up in the punk scene with from South Boston. And so I, you know, I've always been very careful to not, you know, try to actually steal Southie valor because, you know, I, uh, I wouldn't want to, uh, accidentally disrespect my friends in that way. But, um, I mean, when they were making this movie, they even said that, you know, it's because it's based on a book. I think it's the book was called Prince of Thieves. And the at the time that they were making the movie, this was, you know, many years after the book itself had come out. And to some extent, it does describe a Boston that no longer exists, even in Charlestown. I mean, so much of Southeast, so much of Charlestown, even Dot now um, has been gentrified in a way that, you know, makes a lot of the city almost unrecognizable compared to, you know, what it would have been as few people seem to realize that actually uh, South Boston has actually gotten whiter over time as it's gotten richer, um, which is kind of funny because, you know, if you would listen to folks, you would think that it's a, a more diverse neighborhood now that we're, you know, 50 years removed from busing. Um, but that doesn't, that isn't actually the case. But these guys, I mean, Boston, Boston is no longer busing. Yeah. No longer busing. No longer the bussy. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. These guys are still out here, you know and I mean? In different ways. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I remember even just, you know, like, uh, when I used to live in the Polish triangle, you know, seeing like the, uh, wannabe gangster kid who lived down the way, um, you know, uh, jump up on the hood of a Cadillac in the middle of the day and start like breaking, uh, the windshield, uh, with his work boots. Uh, you know, and I know, uh, you know, I mean, I know a few bars around where I knew I was accepted as a regular because it meant that the owner would take out his little black book and, uh, take bets in front of me, you know, I mean, so that kind of. You know, those things are out there. There are, you know, still kind of wise guys around in the, you know, both in the, the Irish way and the Italian way, but it's definitely a lot less common than it used to be. And it's, you know, and that's one of it's kind of interesting because now, you know, you're kind of even getting a third step removed. I mean, if, you know, the 
the prototypical Irish scumbag guy is kind of a copy of a copy of what they understand, you know, a similar figure, you know, their version of being a, uh, you know, kind of vaguely, uh, you know, uh, scummy, like, you know, IRA foot soldier, maybe in the seventies. Now you kind of get, you know, uh, sales managers who are moving to Southie, you know, after completing college who are trying to act like they understand Ben Affleck acting in the town because that's what they understand, you know, and it's kind of, so it's just kind of the transitive property of Irishness. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that as well, because obviously, you know, Ben Affleck has like a fantastic Carhartt jacket on. And I'm pretty sure like now there is dudes who work for like Salesforce or, you know, our lawyers who are rocking around in, like a Carhartt jacket that they would have bought off, you know, Ben Aff- someone who is like Ben Affleck's character, you know, pre-distressed so they can look like a proper, you know, hard dude. It's actually funny. I don't know if Carhartt does this yet, but I know there's a there's a workwear company that recently relocated my hometown and they actually sell uh like return distress stuff that's not too damaged. Um which I which I I never thought about it that way before, but now I suddenly understand the target market. <laughs> It's a, it's sales execs who live in Southie. Yeah. I mean, it really is, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a different thing. Uh, and I'm, you know, even Charlestown too. I mean, it's different. It, everyone suddenly realized that there were these, uh, uh, enclaves that were actually pretty fucking close to the city that they could move into and buy a house in. And so everything went from, uh, I, you know, I joke with one of my friends that, um, instead of buying, instead of going to college 20 years ago, I should have bought a triple decker and I would be a millionaire by now. Yeah, but see, I, I think I I think I got a drop for this. Please, what the fuck is it with you guys in Charlestown? Don't they teach you how to read? Come on, let's go. This thing's here. Read them. Yeah, I don't want to read that. This is this shit. It doesn't sound. I'm not asking. It's not a choice. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Read the. I'm pages, trying to please. make the shit sound fucking authentic. You got it all fucked up. Authentic what? Yeah, see, they're they're just trying to be authentic, you know. <laughs> that's a uh, that's a you know at some point too I'll make you uh you know. Uh, watch Boondock Saints and you can learn uh, some additional words that have been created because of uh, Boston Irish cinema, uh, like symbology. That's another great one there. But see, there is, you know, a really interesting counterpoint to the Charlestown kind of like hard dudes that, you know, Renner and Affleck are playing. And that's Pete Postlewaite's character, who is supposed to be obviously someone who is an Irish immigrant directly having come from what I assume would be Northern Ireland, although his accent is fucking all over the place. I have a clip pulled out. I'm going to play in a second. And I, from my research uh, that I have done way, way back into Irish involvement in crime in the US is that it, there is always kind of an intermediary, particularly with Irish groups that are involved in crime and a kind of arbiter who is like someone from the old country that has, you know, is kind of a fixer and ironically uh titus williver is that in sons of anarchy as well he's part of the ira in sons of anarchy so we got a lot of uh old world guys but the thing that i found really interesting because like pete postlewaite is like a, a really esteemed like character actor he's been on stage you know he's been in shit loads of movies and he's done like he's played a lot of irish characters a lot of uh, characters from all over the world but for some reason, he's trying to do an impression of Jerry Adams in this movie. <laughs> and a really bad one at that. Who knew he was actually the one uh, doing the uh, Jerry Adams for the BBC for the last uh, 30 years. Let me tell you now, Boston, Massachusetts will be reunited with the United Republic. A United Ireland includes Massachusetts. <laughs> but here we're going to have, bear that, bear that in mind, because that is a somewhat accurate rendition of Jerry Adams. Here is Pete Postlewaite's a Fergie character. You're going to do this for me? Or I'm going to clip your nuts. Like I clip your daddies. It's funny because with that diction, all I can imagine is uh, Obama saying that. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can get that and seven plus years of bonus content uh, all on our Patreon. Patreon.com slash hell of a way. To die, you should, uh, you should be on that. And, uh, you know, if you don't want to give us money, we do appreciate the listens. We do appreciate the positive reviews and you sharing us around to all of your people. Um, we, we do a lot of, we, we get a lot of our stuff from word of mouth. So, uh, and that means your mouths. So get yeah. out there. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And we will talk to you next week. Yeah.